Hello, uh, good morning and welcome to this session on emerging forms of social identities and social formation. Um, my reading list is not quite as up-to-date as uh, Jenon Dusser, so I'm going to quote an old dead Greek man in starting. Uh, I believe it is Aristotle who said, man is by nature a social animal. Anyone who either cannot lead the common life or is so self-sufficient as not to need and therefore does not partake of society is either a beast or a god. Uh, Aristotle had evidently not had dinner with a modern teenager weaponized by a model device. Uh, he manages to both be social and antisocial at the same time and often behaves as both beast and god. <laughs> the point is, of course, that uh, notions of sociability and social structures change because the conditions under which we live and love change. And optical, uh, optimal social structures are those that best support the flourishing of the greatest number. Today we want to look at what some of those emerging social identities might be. Um, and perhaps more importantly, we might want to ask of our speakers that they address the question of what attitude we should have towards different social identities and social formations that we might foresee coming up in the near future. Um, the world in which that modern teenager will become an adult is one that's very different from the one that uh, we have gone through and many of the social structures that um, he or she uh, will want for herself or himself would be quite unrecognizable to us. Should we then view those um, uh, possibilities with prescription, worse still prohibition, or um, with permission, curiosity perhaps, and welcome? Uh, to speak to these things, uh, we have uh, two very well qualified speakers. Uh, I will first introduce um, Minister Desmond Lee, who is Minister for Social and Family Development and the second minister in the Ministry of National Development. Um, Mr. Lee narrowly escaped being taught by me at NUS Law, so I'm looking forward to being able to ask him some questions. I later will protest, on. Prof. I'll be very happy to. <laughs> Um, uh, on my left is uh, Professor Pauline Strawn, who is Professor of Sociology and Dean of Students at uh, Singapore Management University and her areas of research. Um, don't discriminate be between young or old. Um, I understand that um, she investigates on the one hand environmental risk factors in childhood obesity and on the other hand, um, you know, uh, successful aging in Singapore, Seoul, and Shanghai. So I think we have uh, two speakers who are very well placed to address uh, the issues at hand, and uh, it's my pleasant job uh, to yield the podium to Minister Desmond Lee. Somehow, when I always attend NUS or NUS related events, I find the podiums are all very tall. <laughs> I was once at the Guild Hall speaking about uh, social services, and all the audience could see was the podium talking. <laughs> because some of these rostrums were built for auditorium which has seating upwards and not downwards. But we live with what we have. Prof. Eleanor Wong, Prof. Pauline Strawn, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and I thank IPS for inviting me to join this panel and look forward to a good discussion. Contrary to what uh, Prof. Eleanor had said, uh, I see myself here as a student to learn from uh, all of you on social issues that we need to look at. And so in, in as far as I seek to share some thoughts on social identity in Singapore, what I'm more keen on is to be able to listen to you. Our focus is on emerging forms of social identity and what this means for our identity as a nation. A few weeks ago, I participated in a work plan seminar. And during the warm-up session, we played a game called Diversity Circles. Each of us were asked to hold a card to our foreheads. Uh, each card bore a big circle, but they were of various colours. Uh, we could see the card that others held on their foreheads, but could not see our own. The facilitator asked us, 
to group ourselves and just gave us one minute and we scurried around the room, but we were not allowed to speak, not allowed to communicate verbally. And as we went around the room in silence, some would point and signal to us to join this group or that, and in turn, we tried to be helpful and sought and arrange. And at the end of 60 seconds, we had grouped ourselves according to the color of the circles, and it was perfect grouping, and everyone was very happy. But during reflection, the facilitator challenged the group to explain why we grouped ourselves this way. Somebody said, well, because we all carried circles of the same color, so same identity, same group, a natural. Then the facilitator asked, was there any other way we could have grouped ourselves? Because the instruction simply was, group yourself. He didn't say, group yourself according to this or that or this or that. And on reflection, some thought, we could have grouped ourselves entirely randomly, disregarding shape and color. Others said we could have formed groups that had one circle from each color in the room. Then someone said, hey, why not form one big group? We were of different colors, but all of us carried the same circles. Look at commonalities, try to look beyond distinctions and differences, and construct a broader identity. But this was after deliberate thought, wasn't immediately instinctive. It was a simple exercise, all done in under 10 minutes, warmed up, then ready to go into work plan. But to me, it was, and to others, it was a valuable reminder about the motivations, the instincts, and the behaviors that identity can drive in all of us. Indeed, identity is as much a decision as a matter of fact. The circles have colors, but it was a decision to let color matter. This awareness about identity is critical for our cohesion in Singapore because with globalization and the increased permeability of ideas, beliefs, and practices across borders, Singapore has become indeed more diverse and more colorful. Diversity, however, is not new to us. It has always been core to our national identity. As a society, we are multiracial, multicultural, multireligious, and multilingual. But beyond race, culture, language, and religion, uh, people also wear multiple other identities, such as gender, such as generation, whether it's X, Y, or millennial, social economic status, and various indicators of them, common life experiences, our professions or trades, our interests or the causes that move us to action and arouse our passions, such as the environment, biodiversity, the arts, sports, heritage, social causes, and so on. If we group ourselves tightly and exclusively along our own set of identities, it can segment and stratify us, and diversity becomes a method for division. But if we can establish a broader common identity and also draw strength from our differences, diversity can indeed be a method for addition and cohesion. We have framed our overarching national identity along principles such as meritocracy, fairness, cohesion, and trust. But what this means is that we recognize our diverse heritage while working towards a common future. Singapore achieves progress and benefits citizens. In the same vein, we maximize common space through shared experiences such as in our schools and national service and more, which help to strengthen a sense of national identity and being. There are also common enduring values that underpin the story of Singapore. We strive to be a caring society built on strong families and communities where we look out for each other and also give back. As DPM Kaman said last night, the Singapore ambition is to continue moving up an escalator. And if anyone should fall behind, we should all be prepared to lend a hand. We also value cohesion, where each of us puts the common good above our own interests. This involves moving beyond tolerance towards deeper mutual understanding and appreciation for different communities. And looking forward, we desire a confident future where there is trust between Singaporeans as well as in our institutions. And dialogue and conversation, tentative, then being more engaging and deeper in nature is one important way to go. Building common space is an ongoing, conscious and active endeavor. As each ge new generation of Singaporeans seek to renew the compact, and common spaces of today may not be enough. We may need to find new common spaces, new ways to dialogue, in the real world and the virtual space. 
Now, let me move on to some brief observations on race, nationality, family, religion, and class. Our families are becoming more culturally diverse. More Singaporeans are marrying partners from a different race or nationality. And you can see it on the chart on the screen. The percentage of inter-ethnic marriages was 22% last year, an increase of six percentage points over a 10-year period. A significant proportion of Singaporeans are also marrying foreigners. More than one in three citizen marriages last year involved transnational couples. And with this, there are more inter-ethnic babies, more young people growing up with diverse cultures to support them, and mixed race identities. With immigration, we are also seeing greater diversity in our cultural makeup over time. Religious identity has also evolved. One aspect of this is increasing religiosity and secularism too, partly due to influence beyond our shores and the ease of the internet. Growing segments of our population are holding their religious beliefs and doctrine more strongly, while others are advocating for non-religious approaches and strict models of secularism. Religious extremism is a particular concern, as problematic and exclusivist doctrines from elsewhere are imported into Singapore. For example, we have seen some Singaporeans become self-radicalized online. And this can lead to deep misunderstandings about the nature of Islam and breed fear and distrust between Muslims and non-Muslims. And Islamophobia has grown in many parts of the world, and we are certainly not immune to it. I need to actively keep watch for this. More recently, the class divide has been drawn in sharp relief. Much of the discussion last night and in fact this morning was along the lines of inequality and poverty, structural issues. Some have argued that it is the sharpest social division, not race or religion. IPS released a study last year that showed how many Singaporeans do not have diverse social networks with people from a different class. And this is something the government has been concerned with and committed to working with the community to address. Inequality is a global phenomenon and the realities of economic and technological disruption will affect our social mobility. Professor Walter Tazira and my colleague, Mr. Josephine Teo, had discussed this with all of you earlier in the morning. Now let me spend a little bit of time on family and social forms. Family continues to be a fundamental pillar of society and the social norm in our society is that of a couple marrying, bringing up children. Indeed, Singaporeans continue to have strong aspirations to get married and have children. Today, as families get smaller, we also see the extended family coming in to provide meaningful relationships and support. Every individual is still very much of a family, part of a family, regardless of age, marital status, or living arrangement. More types of family forms have been emerging over the years and gradually shaping our conception of Singaporean families. But these are not forms that have arisen overnight. They've evolved over years and decades. First, as mentioned earlier, transnational couples form a significant part of our marriage cohort. This has led to greater ethnic and cultural diversity in our families. Second, we've seen a rise in the number of reconstituted families. More people divorce and then remarry. In reconstituted households, one or both parents have children from a previous marriage. Some can be young, some could be grown up, and they may live without their children or with their stepchildren in a new family. Last year, 23% of marriages were remarriages for one or both parties, which is a 4% increase from the year 2000. Third, there is a growing number of people who are delaying marriage or not marrying at all. We have seen an increase in one-person households, which doubled from the year 2000 to 2017. In 2017, there were 168,000 of such households. Supporting marriage and parenthood remains a key priority. However, we've been adjusting our policies over the years to meet the needs of those who remain single. Since 2013, singles aged 35 and above have been able to apply for BTO flats and are eligible for HDB housing grants. Those who buy resale flats to live with or near their parents and near their parents was added very recently, are also eligible for these grants. 
The fourth observation is on single parent households, which are about 7% of all resident households. Now these households are mainly headed by widowed, divorced, or separated parents, but they also include unwed parents, unwed mothers, unwed fathers. Parliament debated the issue of extended paid maternity leave to unwed mothers over many, many years. And we made that change in 2017 so that they can better care for their children. This year, HDB removed the three-year time bar for divorcees to buy or own a subsidised flat to support their housing needs and that of their children. And we continue and must continue to review our policies to accommodate families in different circumstances. Now, the final observation is that besides the family and its variant forms, there are also other social forms in Singapore society that should, we should be aware of. I spoke earlier about single-parent households, largely headed by divorcees or widows or separated parents, but also including single unwed mothers or fathers. Second, there are households where we see grandparents effectively taking over the role of parents to look after their grandchildren because the parents are no longer in the picture for a variety of reasons, divorce, abandonment, demise, or incarceration of parents. The grandparents often apply to be guardians and play the role of parents. Third, we also see households where the older siblings exhibit parentified behavior, or they behave like parents to the younger siblings. They have to step up to perform the role played by parents and become adults very quickly, even at a young age, because the parents are absent. I've seen some cases, for example, where siblings have to fend for themselves because their parents divorce, each remarry, form their own families, and neither side wants the children from their initial marriage. In some cases, extended families, uncles, aunts step in, but when they grow up, they effectively become on their own. Fourth, we have cohabiting households comprising heterosexual or homosexual couples. Our social policies balance between maintaining strong support for marriage and family while making space for the increasingly prominent diversity in family and social forms. But it is not government policy on its own that decides the future of society and family forms and social forms. But society itself, communities, individuals, families that shape the social discourse in a direction in which society evolves. Diversity will always be central to the Singapore story. But to draw strength from diversity is not always natural and cannot be left to mere instinct, as the diversity circles example shows. Because it, we tend to pull in the other direction, to adhere to identity, to adhere to safe spaces, to adhere to common group identity. We need the community to provide active and proactive counterweights. So the government is partnering the community to create more spaces and platforms, and newer spaces and platforms for people of different backgrounds to come together. I will just highlight two. You may know more of them. One is the Singapore Cares Movement, which celebrates and supports ground-up volunteering and giving. We work with charities to identify and shape and share more about needs on the ground, shape volunteering opportunities, and match givers to causes. Anyone can sign up to volunteer if you download the app, the SG Cares app. In the course of giving, you'll mix with people of different backgrounds, all wanting to give, but with different points of view, different perspectives, different socioeconomic status, and different visions of life. You make friends with them as you volunteer, and you may also find that you have much in common with the communities that you started off intending to support. Another effort is Bridge. We are very good for acronyms, and acronyms for very long titles. BRIDGE stands for Broadening Religious Racial Interaction Through Dialogue and General Education. But BRIDGE is enough. I think it conveys the point more clearly. It is a series of community-driven initiatives by MCCY with community partners to foster better understanding and appreciation across religions and cultures in Singapore. One initiative that encourages open, respectful conversation is the Ask Me Anything series under Bridge. And you see an example on the screen, where people of different religions put themselves in the hot seat 
to answer questions. And the conversations sometimes get uncomfortable because nothing about religion is off limits. But that is precisely the point of the exercise. It is a safe space to discuss sensitive issues respectfully. And this is a refreshing way to learn how to approach racial and religious diversity, which continue to be fault lines that we must watch vigilantly. Identity constantly evolves, changes, forms, and reforms. It is not immutable. Our Singapore identity also has to be constantly formed and reformed as society and its aspirations change. Society in Singapore must continue to celebrate diversity and strive for inclusivity. We must remember the idea of Singapore, that we may all be different, but yet in many important ways, we are the same. We love our food, many of us do NS, we speak Singlish, we drink recycled water. We are all the same in the broader circle of things. And we must continue to feel this way, to do this in spite of the challenges and trends that are pulling in different directions. Calls to adhere to exclusive identities that pull away from the broader, broader Singapore narrative. More than ever, we have to put our heads together and our hearts together and retain our commitment to work, work towards our common future for this island. And this is our responsibility and duty towards each other and towards generations as yet unborn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll now ask Professor Strawn to take the seat. Well, first, I want to thank IPS for inviting me. It's such a privilege to be here, and IPS has set the stage for evidence-based research to inform policies, and I've been so privileged to walk with IPS since uh, my days at NUS, and I'm now at SMU, so remember that, okay? To be invited to speak at this session is a godsend for someone like me, a quiet activist. So I ask myself, with Minister sitting here, and he's such a sweetheart, in 20 minutes, what can I ask of him? So I broke it down into four points. I'm not a greedy person, right? So I started with what is easily, well, not, nothing is easy, but what is achievable? The whole of community in partnership with government approach to bring on board more inclusiveness in our nation building and then I end with what I feel is one of the most difficult, but we have to address it. So we start with diversity in our population. And I'm so glad that that was one of the first things that Minister addressed. We now have a very diverse population because of immigration and because many of us Singaporeans have had the privilege of going overseas. So I myself form one of the percentage of a bicultural family. And my children are proudly Singaporean, but also proudly wearing an American heritage tag. How do we then curate a future discourse as we are setting the stage for writing the Singapore story? How do we include their narratives? Our traditional CMI is not going to be enough. Even for the traditional CMIs, you know, we've heard complaints that the Chinese say, you know, we're not just Chinese, we are Cantonese, we are Hokkien, we come from different parts of China. How can we, at the same time, keep our cultural roots, but contribute to a common pool of a, you know, identifiable, homogeneous Singapore identity? Not easy and then it gets more complicated, right? Then before the Eurasians have a chance to say, the O is not quite us, then we start to pad up that O with a lot more other people. And now, who constitutes that O? If you look, if you had been paying attention to ministers' slides, it's close to 60% of marriages. That's a majority, right? So moving forward, I think we have to have very concrete plans as we curate the Singapore identity to remember that we have bicultural families and we also have new citizens. 
Now, new citizens, when they come on board, we have to remember, we invited them. And we invited them because we believe that they can bring value add to our nation-building endeavor. Surely, when we invite them, we don't expect them to shred their cultural heritage. How are they going to grow roots if we deroot them to start off with? So we have to be confident as we speak of an inclusive community and society that we are not going to be distracted by mischief makers on social media that encourages us that xenophobia is okay as long as we are talking about foreigners. The minute we allow that, that foreigner-Singapore divide will soon creep into a new norm and then we end up hurting the very fabric that makes Singapore a unique and strong society. The minister has already talked about family. So I'm a family sociologist. For the longest time when I lectured uh, sociology of family, you can't really talk about family and lecture family without first defining family. Right? Otherwise, what, what are we discussing? So the first few lectures will always be rested on this notion of what is family? What exactly are we studying? So family, in sociological jargon, is a social construct. It is just a word, a labor, that over time we have given it a definition. And that because there's no challenges to that definition, over time, to the lay community, it becomes an objective definition. It is like you can just look and identify family. So we often, we often start off with an exercise, right? Define family. And my students will go out and talk to their friends. And as the years go by, the definition of family and my family has so much divergence. When we are pressed to define family. Many of you and many of us in this room will say married, heterosexual couple with their biological children. And those who think, you know, a little bit more and say, oh, adopted also can. And then after a while, if you let it rest, let that silence sit for a little while, then they go, okay, sometimes there will be divorce involved. And then you let that rest a little while, and then you go like, well, sometimes there is single families, and so it challenges us. We form many, many policies based on the recipient family. But that assumes that family as a social construct stays stable. So I'm so glad to hear Minister challenge us to expand the definition of family. So coming from MIN -S MSF, this is great news, right? So I'm always grateful that God sends the best people to MSF. Let me now talk a little bit about our marriage trends. It's a very uncomfortable conversation for me. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm known to be the person who promotes marriage and every, my poor students, every time they meet me, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? When are you getting <laughs> married? Don't wait too long. Do you have kids? How many? So, you know, after a while, I think they try to avoid me when they don't have affirmative answers. The last, the latest statistics tell us that close to 70% of Singaporeans in the age group 25 to 29 are single. And we highlight this all the time. Why? Well, because if by that time they are not married, then it has implications for our total fertility rate, right? You all know that this cause. But let me focus on the feelings of those who are single. So I'm always very careful that I distinguish the singers into two parts. Singer by choice, and in which case we must respect that choice and stop preaching an alternative discourse. Then there is 
singers, singer by circumstance. This is where we need to pay attention. It's not fair for us to keep preaching marriage and family formation if we don't understand what are the circumstances that makes it difficult for young Singaporeans to find happiness in couplehood and family. And I can tell you that as a family sociologist who has been doing research in this area for as long as I can remember, I have no clue why we are having so many problems. I can guess, but I am not in the shoes of my single colleagues who are walking this very difficult terrain in their life phase. So here is where I want to challenge us to put our resources where the talk is. If we are serious about understanding why it is so difficult for young Singaporeans to find a partner, then we really have to invest in research that walks their life journey with them. Here, I'm going to you know, push government to think about putting funds into longitudinal studies, and IPS has a fantastic social lab who can be convinced and persuaded to engage in this endeavor. This is the main thrust of what I want to push for today. IMH has started this fantastic conversation beyond the labor, right? If you have not seen their videos, please just go online and click on it. In the video, at least the one that I've seen, two young Singaporeans who are suffering from clinical depression engage in a conversation openly about the trials and difficulties they face just because they have mental illness, right? So, mental illness, I've been searching for the statistics uh, for the past year or so, ever since I've decided that I'm going to invest my time in this next research topic. The percentage of the incidents, right? The closest I've come is one in six adults suffer from one or more than one category of mental illness. The IMH uh, longitudinal study uh, by Prof Chong identifies that when it comes to depression and OCD, about 10%. But we know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm in tertiary education and I see the pain in my students and I see an increasing group who have no choice but to step forward for help. Mental illness, like diabetes and any other kind of chronic disease, will not go away just because we can hide it well. And I think it's extremely unfair that we continue to allow those who are afflicted to bear the burden of the cloak of anonymity. Why should they have to hide a disability or an illness? That's just not right, right? So stigmatization has to be lifted. But it's easier said than done because that stigma is entrenched by popular culture, right? Whenever you want a horror flick, just make sure that the perpetrator has mental illness. It's entrenched by media, you don't talk, where's the media? You don't talk about you know, those who are successful, who have successfully overcome mental illness. Well, mainly because you don't know who they are and, 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 and you can't find them. But whenever there is a problem, when there is a violence, and immediately the headlines would be, oh, this person had, you know, suffers from schizophrenia or paranoia, et cetera, et cetera, and as a result, hurt many. And so we create and perpetuate this stereotype of a mentally ill person as a dangerous person that needs to be isolated. And that is just not right. Because if you, if you look around you and if you 
listen and track, you would notice that many amongst our friends, our family, our peers are suffering from various forms. So moving forward, as we pledge to build an inclusive society, I think we really need to put our resources again in creating a safe space for those with mental illness, for persons with other types of disabilities, for those with an alternative sexual orientation, a safe space for them to come out and say, I am who I am, and I can be a contributing member of Singapore society. And that there be no discrimination in the workplace, in schools, in the community. So in identifying the wants, I'm very careful that when we talk about building a new social compact, it is not just a government's role. Government is important when it comes to setting up policies that can push forward agendas, removing structures that individuals may not be able to do so. But to build that our next 50 years of Singapore as a resilient, strong and cohesive community, it has to be an all of community effort. It has to come from us first that we must be willing to say, get rid of the stigma, don't perpetuate it, eradicate fear that comes from ignorance and pledge to get to know more. So knowledge is important and we have to continue to address the concerns of truth versus fake news. Perhaps the most difficult, and many this morning, and I understand um, DPM Taman has already tried to address this last night, our angst with inequality. Play with me, all right? May I ask you, how many of us in this room feel that we have been left behind? in one way or another. Would you like to raise your hands? You're the most boring audience ever. <laughs> All right, speak to God. Okay, now, the problem with this difficult conversation on inequality is not just poor versus not poor. Otherwise, I don't think we would be so worried about this. The problem with our angst right now is also not, um, what did Walter call it, elite guilt? Walter doesn't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure if, if, if it's even about that. I think the problem is many of us, especially our middle-class bulk, identify with this notion of being left behind. So to address this angst, there are two important questions that we have to ask. And the first is, what constitutes poverty, right? So we have a PCI per capita income line and MSF, constantly revisits it to make sure that, you know, that income line is drawn in a fair and equitable manner and that it reflects adequately cost of living concerns and so forth. I think that's the easier part because once identified, then all the policies can be streamed in and all the helplines can be extended and then we just need to match, right? That's the easier part. The more difficult part is the larger concerns of inequality. So let me give you examples. University students, they're constantly stressed out. And I can't understand why. Because, you know, 
you are already in university. You, are, you, are, you know, the, you, you got the place in a local university. What is the problem? And then they tell me stories of how they look at their parents, and their parents have achieved. They are at a certain level in the hierarchy. And they look at themselves. They sacrifice a lot in order to stay ahead of the grading curve. And then they graduate, and they go like, okay, I'm now going to be like my parents. And then they find that, oh my goodness, they are right at the bottom of the pile again, right? When they enter work. And then they look ahead and they go like, there is no way I can achieve what my parents have achieved. And it really drowns them because self-doubt, concerns about, you know, optimism about the future, all that contributes to the incidence of depression amongst our youths. And we cannot say, oh, that is so trivial and frivolous, you know, just snap out of it, because that is the reality they live in. So the Singapore being a very small country, there are benefits and then there are challenges. The benefit is because we are small, the pioneer leaders were able to gather us together and then, you know, with the limited resources that we have, we built nation in a very short time. And we could bring as many people as possible on board. But because we are small, any differential is magnified. So I speak again of standing in between Havelock Road on the Singapore River. On the left, you have those nice condominiums, Clark Key area, right? Beautiful condominiums with swimming pool all out in the open and people worshipping the sun and all, right? Across the road on the right up on the hill, we have our renter flats. I don't know about you, but it's very jarring and disturbing for me when I stand like that because it's just uncomfortable. So those kinds of comparisons we see every day, the line that draws that differentiate between the have and have not, my point, is not so simple. So again, I think we have to invest resources into distilling based on an empirical, you know, evidence-based perspective where the differences are and where the pain points are. Because some of those differences can be addressed without raising income tax. I'm always worried when we say income tax, you know, it's too low because I don't want to pay more money. But, you know, there are other things that community can do. So I end with an example. A student came to see me and asked, I come from a poor family. So, ma'am, how can I make sure that I can continue to keep up? This is an SMU undergraduate. And I told him, given your family's disadvantages, you are here through scholarships, through bursaries. And I said, that's already a big gain. And the, and the student came from a good junior college. So I said, so this is how you view your life now. Your family may be disadvantaged economically, but because we have an inclusive education system, you have made it through. So now, the tax on your life include alumni of your JC. Soon, it will be alumni of SMU. So whatever gains the SMU and your, your junior college have made, they become your personal gains, right? And we go on like that. But how do we achieve that kind of success rhetoric? Again, it is through ensuring that there is adequate mixing in our schools. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you. Thank you very much to both our speakers. Um, I hate to be um, com common or to, to follow the, the, the usual um, practice, but uh, I will take my privilege of being um, a facilitator and uh, do the usual thing, which is to ask a couple of questions of both the, the speakers here. Um, some of the themes that we're hearing coming through um, are that we can expect increased diversity. Another theme that I'm hearing is, is about the community pulling together 
um, to some extent, it's not some, this is an unusual area where it's not necessarily about government uh, prescribing anything. If, if, if anything, that's something we want to avoid. And, um, you know, throughout uh, these proceedings, we've heard a lot about DPM's uh, uh, memorable analogy of the escalator um, with its implication of sort of direction you know, going up is somehow better than being at the bottom, but in the area of social structures, etc., cetera, um, uh, it may well be just a question of different choices. I may well want to take the steps. Um, it may well be that uh, walking down that, uh, you know, country path um, downhill is actually the better, um, uh, <laughs> you know, gives me the, the, the better um, view, right? So given, given that, right, um, is it the government's place to essentially be neutral to many of these um, uh, choices that people uh, may choose to make? Um, and is it possible for us to get through um, almost 40 minutes of this without talking about Section 377A? All right, um, in, in that context. Um, for <laughs> Yeah, I, I do hate being common, but sometimes I just have to say what I have to say. Um, for for um, Pauline, I just, um, you know, it's the flip side of that is as we, you know, if we allow people to sort of just be who they are, express who they are, et cetera, um, one of the phenomena that we see happening internationally um, is increased divisiveness and difference because on, on these issues, there may be no sort of correct agreed position to take. and. Um, uh, respecting different views can also lead to those views being expressed in extremely vitriolic and unhappy ways. Do you see that happening in Singapore um, and becoming a real problem for us? Or will the relative calm and civility of the way in which we conduct these sorts of discussions continue to be um, the, the, um, the attitude of discourse in Singapore going forward? So perhaps first, um, Minister, and then Professor. Thank you, Prof. Um, those Singapore has always been diverse, and we've navigated diversity and turned it into a strength. In the early years, diversity was a fragility in society, easily exploited, and then progress couldn't be achieved. Uh, it required a rather paternalistic approach, a rather prescriptive approach mm -hmm. in the early years to drive a common identity amongst groups who didn't quite identify with each other or identify with the place. And those were different times. I'm not saying that today government needs to be completely agnostic about values and about the shape of society, but we are one of many players in the universe of Singapore society uh, who help to shape, nudge, converse, dialogue. Uh, certainly our policies today contribute to people's views on what the family is, what social norms are. But increasingly, you see that society differentiates. People make choices. People live their lives. And we need to make sure that our policies are responsive to some of these social forms. For example, I spoke earlier about multicultural families. Uh, how do you address the housing needs uh, in an EIP uh, policy? framework for new housing? How do you adjust for these things? How do you support uh, single parent families? And the call has been strong and people are sympathetic. How do you address um, grandparents looking after grandchildren and having to navigate the day-to-day, -day, applying for passport, applying for FAS for their grandchildren? How do they navigate? And so whilst we can have broad social constructs supported by the main frame of government policy. Uh, we need to make sure that there are vows in place. Uh, some are vows, some are shunts, some are diversions that are hardwired in, some are exceptions. So these will then allow society to function, allow people to live their lives, and then reduce that level of paternalism that alluded to. I, I think you may not have entirely answered the question. And so, so some, um, some might actually be gates that prevent people from even getting to the table. 
Gates. Maybe you give me examples then. Uh. Three seven seven eight. Well, opposition. and actually the gates yeah. are, are, are locking <laughs> gates. <laughs> you know, they're, they're prison gates. They're not even sort yeah. of um, don't come to the buffet table. They're sort of um, yes. you know uh, if you come close, we're gonna pick you up, put you in a paddy wa wagon, and send you off. And and I'll stop after this. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I I know there are many questions coming after the, uh, coming yeah. from the table. But, but I'm I, to, I just thought you know I'm prepared yeah. to talk about three seven seven eight. It's just that I also we hope also that the other social forms and the other issues that people face in society. Uh, like single parenthood, like grandparents, Absolutely. all these are also addressed, yep. like mental health. Agreed. Uh, but, Prof, the analogy of the gate is apt. Because for many people in society, they see uh, the approach as being one of breaking gates down. Uh, our society, you've seen the polls. You've seen the polls, and they are reflective of people's innermost values and emotions. It is a deeply fraught issue because it is not just something that the external environment can impose, but it is in people's hearts and emotions. And it's not entirely just purely an irrational thing. And so the legal arguments about the constitutionality, the legality, the appropriateness of a law such as 377A have been canvassed. People have spoken about it. Present and, and previous attorneys general have articulated it very eloquently. And this is before the courts. And so we let the courts decide. But let's talk about the broader social undercurrents that uh, make the focus on 377A uh, a bit larger than it should be. Because it's the larger picture of different segments of society seeing a different future for Singapore society. And one group, a large group, some are religious, some are not, uh, traditionalists, conservatives, even futurists who feel uh, a particular way about where society should hit or should remain, uh, feel that, well, the family, man and woman having children, procreating, uh, is a structure that has served us well. We should continue to support it. We should continue to enable them. Uh, but when you have an alternative approach by activists who say, well, our vision of the future of Singapore society is one where you can have marriages of a different form, uh, of two men or two women, and different structures of the family. Different or even three women and three two women men. And two and men. And, yeah. uh, or having a society where family and marriage is no longer so important. For example, in some Nordic countries, yes. where marriage isn't a precondition to having a functional family. But those are very, very different societies. So the question that is facing us today and tomorrow is what kind of a society do we see the future of Singapore headed towards? And if social change was e easy, and social change is not contestable, then I think that's not social change of substance. Here we are talking about not just a law, whether it's enforced, whether it's legal. To the majority, they see this as a signpost of moral values. They see this as a signpost of the structure of the norm. But to activists and those who feel a need for inclusiveness for persons with LGBT orientation, they see this as an important gate that needs to be passed in order for their vision of society to evolve. Now, the LGBT issue, if you cast yourself 20 years ago, people speak about it in whispers because of the stigma, because of concern. But today, we are speaking about it openly. Today, 377A is not actively enforced. Today, each year, we have a major ping dot event where many Singaporeans attend, supported by Singapore businesses. Today, you have gay bars, gay entertainment outlets, establishments who operate without having to worry about being open. And so let's accept that Singapore society has changed over the decades, and we're a young society. Society continues to evolve. But on issues such as this, 
fraught with emotion, fraught with personal values, fraught with very, very contrasting visions of what the future will be for our children and grandchildren. I think the conversation, the dialogue must continue. They must be robust. They must be measured. They must be respectful. And I think if our society can navigate that, we will be able to better come to some consensus about the future shape of society that our children must decide for themselves. But I think it's important to recognize that in societies which have, which have made that decision, legislatively, judicially, I, I think it doesn't settle the matter in sure. the hearts and minds of people. And you see that in societies that have legislated for it or that have precipitated change through the judicial pronouncements, these have not settled society. These have not settled groups of people who feel very passionately and strongly about how their children and grandchildren should be brought up. So, not a perfect answer, Prof, but I think that it's okay. the conversation is I can see is how there. you got an A-plus in school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I hope that we can continue this dialogue in an open, uh, honest way, without vitriol, uh, without attacking each other, but seeing ourselves as a broader circle, that broader circle that we're all Singaporeans, and that come what may, however diverse and different our viewpoints are, uh, we ultimately still hold together uh, as one society, because this is all that we have. Thank you, and um, I'll just very quickly uh, put it through. Yes, thank you. I'm glad to hear that even if it's too late for me, maybe uh, my children's generation will be better. But anyway, um, I want to put it through to um, Prof. Strong to uh, maybe talk a little bit about whether she foresees the conversation to carry on in this sort of a civil way or whether we have to worry about increasing vitriolic. You know, Eleanor talked to me on the phone a few nights ago. And she said she was not going to talk about 377A. But neither of them did anything, so I had to step in, right? I am telling you, be careful of lawyers, okay? <laughs> there are two of us here, Prof. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Minister, remember I'm on your side, huh? We are all on one side. Yeah, yes. <laughs> So th thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Eleanor, for that very important question. Um, so, in this conversation of promoting inclusiveness, recognizing and valorizing diversity, right? Diversity is what makes Singapore unique and strong. So we've been the race conversation. Now we take it for granted. Right? C M I O. Everybody's high fiving and now wanting hyphens everywhere. But not that long ago, it was a very difficult conversation for our first generation leaders. So let's remember that, that change takes time. And of course, those who are involved directly would argue, I don't have time, right? I want, I've, I've had my uh, gay students tell me that, you know, it's not, as a family sociologist, I should understand how difficult it is for him not to be able to to bring his, 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 his significant other, you know, up front, right, to platforms and so forth. But his problem was not society, it was his parents. So, so you see, it is not a government problem, right? In most of these very diverse issues, it is a people, a community problem. And as a community, I think we need to learn how to embrace diversity it's not going to happen overnight. And there's a certain type of activism that is going to push the agenda two steps backward when others have moved it one step forward. So here, culture is important. I believe in Singapore society, I'm not going to be able to gain much if I'm going to go out and you know, burn slogans and cause or, you know, disruption because at the end of the day, this is what I teach my students. So as a sociologist, I would argue that our training predisposes us to be activists. Otherwise, don't be a sociologist. You're just wasting that space, right? But when you want change, you have to always remember, and I remind myself this as well, 
do you want change for the people you are fighting for and protecting? Or are you doing this to get that moment in the newspapers? And once we can distill that, so of course everyone says, no, 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 I'm going to do this because, because there's a certain segment of the population that I want to protect. Then I say, excellent. Then that's where you have to put your social science training in practice. To evoke change, if you really want change, you don't go fight it heads on. Unless we have a very, very bad regime, then it's revolution, right? Learn to identify. That's why you go to school, right? Learn to identify where the nexus of influence is and situate yourself in that nexus. Learn to identify where the pain points are and see if you can resolve that so that it becomes a win-win situation because no change is going to come about, especially when you're challenging status quo, if you are expecting that the other side concedes in order for you to gain. So in the conversation on inclusiveness and diversity, there is a happy landing point, and that is to be inclusive makes us stronger. Because we are such a small country to start off with, we only have three and a half million Singaporeans and they are dwindling as we speak, right? So every person on board counts. And that person may not look like you or I, that person may be suffering from mental illness, that person may have alternative sexual orientation. So the important question then is, how can we bring them on board so that they can, they can roll in their sport as fast as I can roll in my sport? So it's a conversation that needs to be continued. I think that we already have several good starts. I mean, Prof. Tommy Cole has spoken and written very eloquently about this. Uh, the latest, uh, Simon, right? And, and many others have stepped forward, you know, and penned their thoughts. So I think it's time for reflection. And we, we, I believe this is an issue, personally, that we have to move forward on um, because I cannot imagine how to answer to my many, many friends, respectable colleagues who, who, who have alternative uh, sexual orientation and to recognize their role in our society. But at the same time, we also understand the pains and the concerns of parents. Parents are very worried, right? And here is the difficulty that poor minister has. Because parents look to government as the moral compass. And parents want to be able to say, this is right. There is no gray area. Parenting in gray is very, very difficult and challenging. So parents want to be able to say, this is right, this is wrong. Stay with the right, avoid the wrong. And sexual orientation is one. You can imagine if you are parents of young children, right? There's so many challenges out on the internet, in news media, in popular culture, and parents are holding on to government to say, please help us to raise our children. And they have a lot of fear. And this fear comes from the social stigmatization, right? Not just on LGBT identities, mental illness, disabilities. They are all there. The fears are there. Why do we have these fears? Because our society is not yet a safe space for these friends and these Singaporeans to step out. So perhaps the first thing that we need to do is to create a safe space. Well, let's start by creating a safe space for uh, questions and Kishore has his hand up and, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a whole bunch of people. So we'll, we'll have Kishore and then there's Kishore. a whole bunch of people at the, at, at the back who stood up already and, um, uh, we'll, we'll take at least three then in a row and then we'll see where we go after that. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. This has been very stimulating. But I would say the most surprising statistic which I saw was from the minister on the number of what trans ethnic mm. and transnational marriages. So if you extrapolate that logically, then if you look at the babies that are being born, the number of babies that are going to be born that are pure Chinese. Chinese mother, Chinese father, pure Malay, Chinese Malay father, Malay mother, and Indian, so on and so forth, is are going to become minorities, obviously. And if indeed the majority of babies are then trans-ethnic or transnational, 
first question is, what do we do with our CMIO identity? It is clearly going to become an antique if the number of babies, the majority big joints O and not C, M or I. And if that's the case, how do we make this transition? Because in some ways we've become quite addicted to the CMIO provisions. But if we don't start preparing for the change, the majority of the babies that are going to be born as they achieve consciousness will say, hey, why am I in the others category? Thank you, Kishore. We'll, we'll continue with the questions at the back next. Yep. Hi, I'm Roy Chan. Um, thanks for bringing us up, Eleanor. I was going to, I stood here first because I heard ni none of this, neither of the speakers say anything about 377. So I was here to make sure it was talked about. Okay, so it's been done. What else do you want to ask? Yeah, I, to, in my mind, I think um, <clears throat> um, it is the biggest, one of the biggest fault lines in our community right now. Sure. Pros and people for repeal and people against repeal. Um, I think that um, unlike mental illness, unlike disabilities, there are no laws that criminalize right. mental illness and disabilities. Yep. And in order to get to re acceptance and inclusiveness, we have to remove a law that criminalizes someone's innate behavior and, and feelings. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Edwina. Um, thank oh. you to both speakers. Uh, I have a question specifically about the government's assumptions that then lead to the kinds of families that they prefer. Specifically, I'm thinking of the transnational marriages and how we tend to privilege white Caucasian partners, but then for a lot of the w um, mm. often wives from Southeast Asia, they can't get PR and are on long-term visitor passes. And in the cases with divorce, sometimes they end up in very, very precarious situations. Um, and so I see this as parallel with a lot of the other ways in which we choose the kinds of families that we want, not from people who are less educated, not from people who are poorer, not from single parents. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I was looking at the IPS 30th birthday and they said that Chinese people in Singapore tend to think that diversity um, is not as um, valuable as people from the other groups. And I can see that that probably comes from the way the government sees Chinese majority as being a good thing. I'm probably coming from Lee Kuan Yew saying that if the racial uh, proportion change, we would be you know, less okay. successful. So I'm just wondering how beyond all the things that you're already saying about social acceptance, how the government and its assumptions and the kinds of families that it desires uh, shapes or limits the choices that people on the ground choose and, and how they think. Thank yeah. you very much. Why don't we just uh, take those first two together? I think, um, Minister, yep. Uh, Prof Kishore, thank you for your question. Um, <coughs> well, the percentage of uh, marriages that are transnational and multi-ethnic are growing. They're not yet in the majority, absolute majority. But you're quite right that we're seeing generations of children growing up uh, with the benefit of multi-ethnicity or multinationality. Uh, with, with regards to nationality, and that's got to do also in a way with Sabrina's question, uh, there is a question of where they anchor their domicile in legal terms. Or where, where do they live? Where do they anchor their roots? And some transnational families relocate overseas, some here, some shuttle to and fro, and have families in both places. Uh, but therein lies the opportunity and the challenge. The opportunity is that uh, you have children who are born with identities that reflect the strengths of the cultures uh, of their parents. And they learn greater acceptance, greater understanding, of identity, of self, and of tolerance to others. The CMIO construct is an artificial construct, just like race is a construct. Chinese, what do you mean by Chinese? There are di different dialect groups, different ethnicities, even within the Chinese population. These are artificial constructs, but they've served us well the, all this while in enabling a conversation to be had between large community groups who 
didn't see themselves as being part of this country. And over the years, having begun to build a national identity, uh, the question was, do you then insist on a melting pot where everyone melts into an amalgam and loses all trace of their cultural origin, their mother tongue, their festivals, their traditions, their beliefs, their values? Or do you want a society where you have a broader Singapore construct, but allowing people to retain the identity of their places of origin? Of course, from a bureaucratic point of view, it has been able to ensure policies like EIP, which have ensured that our housing estates remain a microcosm of the broader makeup of society. But as multi-ethnic families begin to grow in number, we need to make sure that the policies help and certainly not hinder their families' progress, growth and development. And you have now multi-barrel uh, ethnicities, Chinese, Indian, Indian, Chinese. Again, it is an artificial construct because neither Chinese nor Indian are themselves always sufficient for some people to define what their true identity is from a cultural point of view. Uh, so we've adapted some of these uh, policies to ensure that the EIP framework continues to develop and ensure uh, plurality in our heartlands. It has allowed our self-help groups uh, to organize and self-organize, support from the community to help the community. Uh, but as I said earlier, these must evolve, these must change as the composition of our population changes and their sense of their set themselves culturally, racially uh, evolves. I think Maury, Maury John was it? Mm. Maury John spoke about 377A, about yeah, we've articulated about that earlier. Already, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 I understand this point. On Sabrina's point about uh, uh, um, preferences for certain families and the preference for Caucasian foreign spouses, I, I, there is no such preference. There is no such preference. What we want to support are strong, stable families. And there are, I mean, if you look at the diversity of uh, transnational families, uh, with foreign spouses, you have Caucasians, you have Southeast Asians, you have East Asians. It is increasingly diverse. And many uh, spouses who are not from the Western developing world or developed world, but from, say, Southeast Asia, uh, if the family is stable and they're able to support themselves, depending on MHAs and ICS criteria, they do take up root here, they do get the residency status that allows them to function as family here, long-term visit pass, long-term visit pass plus PR and citizenship. There are, of course, a group, the lowest social economic status, uh, who marry, and they may have spouses uh, who may be also uh, equally uh, underprivileged. And it, this, in a way, syncs with the whole debate on inequality and supporting lower-income households. For some reason, because of stresses and strains, some of these families may not be entirely stable. And you can see uh, older spouses with uh, younger wives and vice versa being less stable. And then society having to come in uh, to support them. And so, for example, there are lower educated foreign spouses with young children who find difficulty getting housing and we have to exercise our discretion, ensure that they and their children, often Singaporean children, don't get left out in the cold. And so we exercise discretion case by case, put them in rental housing if need be, provide them with financial support, employment support, and so on. So we have to support those families, the lower ends of socioeconomic status that may have foreign spouses, and because of instability, they break up. We have to come in and support children support the spouses. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to try again and take a few questions because I can see quite a few people standing up and I think we haven't taken anyone from, from, from there. So why don't we, we, we take that and then um, 
will come back to the center aisle in a while. And I apologize for the lights in my eyes. I can't always tell who, who got up first. So I'm just going to you know, mere culpa on that. But we'll take someone there. Uh, hi. So I'm a student from Republic Polytechnic, and I have like something to talk to, to Professor Pauline. Mm. So as you spoke about how you, like, if there's anyone who felt left behind in society, I would like share my experience because I myself felt left behind in the society due to the fact that I did badly in O-level and I ended up in Republic Polytechnic. So given that I knew that feeling, so I tried to prove myself and studied very, very hard in Republic Polytechnic and got a decent GPA. But as I was researching on like the top universities, their criteria of entering, they will also take into account of the O-level grade. So this kind of like pulled me down in a sense that despite me trying very, very hard in a polytechnic, I may not be able to get into it because of my O-level grade. Mm. So, and as we all know in Singapore, it's best to get a degree from a reputable university. And um, this like made me feel as though like I'm very left behind as because when I entered Republic Polytechnic and I told my friends about it, they all told me that I was thrown into a dumping ground because it is said to be the worst polytechnic in Singapore. So I would like to like, find out what are your views on this in a sense that what if the future generation could also be like feeling this feeling which I am feeling and how it might actually enforce in the inequality that we feel and that we don't feel that we are part of the society in terms of our education and our future job prospects. Thank, thank you. you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, Pauline, wanna thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Pauline, quickly, a response? Yes, um, I think your pain resonates with uh, many of us who feel that we have put too much emphasis on, uh, on paper qualification. I person I've said that earlier, right? So let me first start by saying that your RP is not a bad RP. I actually have looked at RP uh, and Good they do wonderful, they, you have a wonderful program that nurtures the intrinsic skills of, your, of students. So be proud of RP, right? Be very proud of RP. Um, moving forward, I do think that you must have optimism in the future. You, you must believe Minister Ong when he says that we're going to move away from mere GPAs and we're going to teach employers how to evaluate our students. So one of the initiatives that you know, I, I am working on now with my friends at SMU is to tease out the qualities of our students as they demonstrate and grow them in co-curricular activities, for example, right? So it comes back to, to I think, minister, uh, this is the wrong minister. <laughs> but that, that my, he has friends. <laughs> a, so Minister a, Ken, a, you're the right only one minister. we have now. <laughs> so <laughs> Minister, <laughs> I think we do need to, as we move forward, as the ground sat saturates, right? We really have to come back to a big circle to learn how to tease out the intrinsic qualities of our youth, because there are so few of them now, and to make sure that they have a place in the growth of Singapore in the next 50 years, and that it won't be a, you know, I, I, I have a lot of problems when we over-reward ourselves based on, you know, whatever criteria. So maybe, you know, we need to also revisit that. How do we, how do we ensure that various levels of employment, there is pride in their job, right? I, and I'm not talking about just money, because money is a very hard, hard press, you know, because we, we know that, you know, once you ask, you know, government to put more money here, more money there, then taxes go up. So I already told you I don't want to pay more taxes. So it is about prestige. There are other goods that we can give in our society. I mean, we, we already have done very well in terms of ensuring that most Singaporeans own their home. That's a very important first start. So those hard things have been taken care of by our first generation leaders. Now moving forward, I think we need to 
delink from you know the kind of hallmarks of excellence that a capitalist economy always bears. That's how much money you you make, and then you know all the prestige factors. And prestige itself is a social construct. So therefore, two things that I would like to see us do, and that is continue to raise wages at the bottom 20, 25% level, so that everyone who is working, employ, you know, who is gainfully employed, can grow a family and have a very decent quality of life. And the second, the notion of prestige, right? That we need to rethink, you know, what prestigious jobs are, who is doing a great job, you know, to keep our everyday lives going and to accord them the kind of respect. So uh, to end, I'll just say, you know, if I am not at work, it really doesn't matter that much. But if my aircon is not working and the technician has gone to Chinese <laughs> New Year, <laughs> you know, for two weeks, I really suffer. And then worse, if my toilets don't work and the plumber cannot come for a few days. So who is more important? Thank you. Thank you. Um, technically, time is up and I'm standing between you and lunch, but I see two persons who have been waiting for a while, so I'm going to break the rules, and um, which is my prerogative, and I'm going to allow the last two questions and then the speakers to have their closing remarks, but if we could keep it short and sharp. Thank you, Eleanor. This is uh, Ruben Wong from NUS. Uh, I just want to thank the panelists and the chair for uh, handling the discussion <laughs> very well and uh, with very sensitive issues. And I thought the panel could also re be renamed uh, dealing with marginalized communities. And of course, marginalized communities include people with mental illness, with criminal records, uh, with disability. Mm. Uh, Pauline said that sometimes it's not a matter of for governments, it's mm. also for the community. Uh, but I think government plays a very important role together with schools or religion in setting the norms for society. And I just wonder when the norms are fit, are set in a certain way in law, they enshrine certain kinds of what is right or wrong, and they favor or disfavor certain groups of people. So would you say that for those who don't fit the norms as they currently stand in law, whatever the law might be, <coughs> that they should just accept a certain measure of substantive, symbolic inequality and learn to, um, to be activists, to fight for a cause, but within certain ground rules. Okay, thank you. I'll take the last question. Hi, I'm Hazim. Oh, okay, the last question is behind me. All right, yes. Sorry, behind me, okay. Yes. Um, yes, my question will be about breaking down the gates or rather stereotypes and beliefs. So for myself, I'm a Malay and I went, through, I went to a good JC and now I'm in university. But I always can't help but notice that there will always be a disproportionate number of Malays inside. And then also to the fact that whenever I do all my non-profit and volunteering work, nearly half of the vulnerable families tend to be from that community, from the Malay community group. And it's also looking at the expectations they set for themselves. And it's really not necessarily the fault of the system, yep. but how does these stereotypes perpetuate to create self-fulfilling prophecies? And how do we break down these stereotypes? Okay, thank you. Did I have one last person? If not, I think both the questions sort of deal, deal with enshrining, um, you know, what's within the box and what's outside the box. Um, I'll ask Pauline perhaps to um, address this and also make her closing remarks, and then we'll give the minister the final say. So now just and then. very quickly, of course, Ruben, the answer is no. You know, no one should feel that they have to live with less because they are born different or they are inflicted you know, with whatever condition. So the question is, how do we meaningfully advance their well-being and make sure that every Singaporean has a place in nation building and has a sense of ownership? Right? So I think we're all on the same page on that. We want to move forward and we want to be inclusive. So the question really is, what is the best way? Is it charging head on and then you know, disrupting everyday life? Or is it you know, to persuasive engagement? I don't have the answer, right? But I do think that in order to build, unless it is a very hard wall, we shouldn't break. 
but we should leverage on the gains that we have made because then we can climb higher together. Thank you. Thank you. I thank both of you for very, very incisive questions. It's important to have conversations about our assumptions. It's important to have conversations about our policies and programs uh, that can better support marginalized communities. It's important to have honest conversations uh, like what Hazim has raised about uh, the position and development of ethnic communities. I think that's important. But what's also important is a call to action and taking proactive steps going forward. And in fact, when I uh, accepted Janadas' invitation to, to come for this session, I was hoping to be able to make this call to action because we have a room full of people from government, from academia, from our schools, from our research community, from our social services, people who can join us in this action plan going forward uh, to tackle some of these very difficult trying issues about marginalization, about discrimination, about ethnic uh, issues and privilege and underprivilege. Uh, and we have to take a different approach to doing these things. You, Ruben, talked about uh, persons with uh, criminal records, the yellow ribbon uh, push. Uh, you talked about persons, and Prof. Pauline talked about uh, mental illness, the silver ribbon uh, push. Uh, you talked about disability, the enabling master plan. There are many, many pushes. There are many, many campaigns. But how we go forward addressing these uh, will make a difference. And to me, I strongly believe that active and equal partnerships in addressing and tackling these challenges is the way forward. Is the way forward. As the strength of community groups, as the strength of civil society grows, we can leverage on equal partners to be able to address some of these difficult challenges. So for example, you talk about disability. And we have an enabling master plan that was established by members of the community, and not just by government. And how do we implement it? Do we leave it to the government to go around and try to put everything together and then make a report every few years? No, I'd rather we evolve the way in which we implement. And so we want to put together working groups led by or co-led by members of the community, say from the disability organizations. They will co-lead with officials to tackle these issues on the ground and see that implementation canvasses the support of the length and breadth of the community. Only then can we ensure total buy-in by everyone and not something that is enforced top-down. You talked about uh, Yellow Ribbon. We have a National Committee on Prevention, Rehabilitation and Recidivism. Uh, it, is, it comprises MOE, MOH, MCCUI, M MSF, self-help groups, youth uh, work organizations, and more. But we also brought in the youth perspective because here we're talking about marginalized youth, youth at risk. Who are we to talk about their needs unless we have a proper understanding of their perspective? So when I was in MHA, I suggested to my colleagues, why not we form a youth advisory group comprising young people who have been through the hard knocks in life? Let them tell us whether our messages, our campaigns, our promotions, our policies, what is the perspective of the marginalized young person? Of course, the initial list that came to me uh, were people, straight A students, you know, top scholars. I said, no, maybe not for this exercise. And I described to them the characteristics of the members I'd like to see. And so very proudly to have on board young people who have been to prison through RTC, through drug rehab, who have gone through valleys in life and emerged, able to share that deep perspective from within their hearts on how they truly perceive the government, how they perceive educators, how they perceive campaigns, how they perceive social work organizations, and they've helped us to evolve the way we do things. I hope to believe for the better. So the approach is one of partnership and implementing 
and solving solutions together. On inequality, it's important to have good discussions, but it's also equally important to pick up the cudgels and get to work. Get to work solving cases one after the other. And so I'd like to invite you uh, to join our community networks on the ground where the action is, where the families reside, where marginalization is felt most keenly, where social workers alongside our officers on the ground tackle families' issues one after the other. We are establishing rental housing hubs right in the heart of every rental precinct. We are starting with three, coming soon. And we want to evolve a new form of proactive social work and create open spaces, wide spaces, for the communities who reside there and for people like you who want to make a difference, whether you're from a corporate organization, whether you're from a school, whether you're from a religious organization, whether you're from a VWO, you want to make a difference, come and join us in this endeavor. Do it in an integrated way. Do it in a way that doesn't stigmatize, that enables rather than disables. These proactive approaches, building structures on the ground, integrating and coordinating the services and the organizations that want to make a real difference to inequality, that want to move the ticker, come and join us in action. I think that is far more important because debate is going to enlighten the issue, but it must translate into action on the ground. Um, uh, that has, brings us to the end of this session. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking both our speakers for a wonderful and stimulating.